think today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so uh, for today's event, we have a really exciting program planned. Um, in the chat also, our team will go ahead and share the program for today. Um, so you can follow along with the agenda and any uh, relevant resources. Um, but again, I'm Janae, I'm a computational biologist. I'm the founder and executive director of BWCB. Um, if this is your first time or if your first exposure to the network, uh, we're a global online networking platform uh, with a mission to accelerate opportunity for Black women in this field. Uh, if this is your first event, again, we'd like to extend a warm welcome. Uh, to learn more about us, please visit our website. Um, and at the end of the event, as I previously mentioned, we'll um, especially welcome your feedback and your insight on how today's proceedings went. So today at the intersection of Black History Month and Women's History Month, we're delving into a crucial conversation about allyship in computational biology. We want to be able to move beyond the buzzword of allyship and start to explore what that truly means for our diverse scientific community. Our session kicks off with insights from a recent survey capturing experiences of nearly 140-ish members and supporters in our Compio community. Transparency is our commitment and today's town hall emerged from our dedication to openly discuss the survey's implications. Following the survey insights, we'll hear three flash talks on intersectionality, women's representation, and allyship interventions. A quick Q&A precedes breakout sessions for digesting talks and connecting with fellow attendees. Returning from breakouts, it's our time to share thoughts and experiences. Guided by some initial questions, let's collaboratively explore ways to enhance allyship and computational biology. Get ready to unmute, share, and engage because your perspectives matter here. We're not necessarily here today to be teachers, quote unquote, but to reach out and help each other gain a better understanding of today's topics. To set the tone for a productive and safe space for discussion, we've established some norms for the event proceedings. Um, these were also shared in via email a couple hours ago for folks who had already um, RSVP'd by that time, um, but they are essentially make space, take space, um, meaning to be mindful of your airtime, uh, speak from the I perspective. As you begin to reflect today or engage in new conversations, try to focus more on how you're feeling as opposed to how others can be reacting to new topics or new ideas. Um, and a kind of along those same lines, uh, seek first to understand. This is a judgment-free zone. So we really want to be able to um, come at uh, these discussions from a new perspective of curiosity. Um, and kind of going along with that as well is lean into any sort of discomfort you might have today. Um, this could come from anyone here in the audience um, who could be experiencing a topic or a difficult topic today. Uh, try to experience and ask yourself why you might be feeling that discomfort, discomfort and where it could be coming from. Um, impact over intent, just being mindful of our words. And then lastly, be as present as possible today. I know we have people joining from so many uh, corners of the world and different times of day. Um, so we're welcome you to you know join and participate as you can, uh, but your presence is super important. Um, almost lastly, Chrissy Bonner, um, she's the founder of Illustrating Progress, will be illustrating a live graphic recording of today's discussion. Um, so you'll see their name here, graphic recording, Chrissy. Um, we'll check in briefly on its progress in the middle of the event, and then the final project will become available on our website afterward. We hope that this illustration helps our community members to visually process and reflect on the discussion beyond the Zoom walls today. This entire event will be recorded and made available at least on our YouTube page. And we'll also make sure to keep these live captions on. Uh, you might be able to turn them off if you don't need them. Um, so again, Melissa and Sagal are in the chat uh, if you if you all need any help. I'm um, gonna help everyone here today can leave with a new perspective, a new connection or a new action item to engage in our Compio community in a new way. All right, triple checking. 
Can we still see the slides? Okay. So let us move on. Um, as we mentioned, we surveyed our community um, at the end of last year, and uh, we compiled a few thoughts um, from our participants. We had about 140-ish respondents to several questions spanning differences in experiences in the computational biology field. Um, if you are some of the respondents, thank you for participating. Um, but we just wanted to give a high level overview. Um, you know, there's no statistical analysis going on here, but we do want to just share um, some some overall thoughts um, as we kind of get ready for discussion later. So um, one of the questions um, that stood out was um, when participants were asked if they felt marginalized or isolated or if they feel supported otherwise in comp bio. The general public, 35% 35, 35 of the general public uh, felt that they did feel isolated, um, whereas 64% uh, of our members uh, felt, the same, felt that they felt isolated. Um, in terms of support, though, um, it seems to be almost balanced, um, but there are a few kind of, I guess, like tips or a few different um, nuances that kind of could be informing these different experiences here. Um, we asked members if they feel that there are adequate uh, mentorship or sponsorship opportunities, whether to participate as a mentor or mentee or to receive that. Um, there seems to be much more uncertainty within our membership group. 33% are not sure or and only 8.9% said yes. Um, whereas the public says that 28.7% um, were not sure and 12.8% said yes. Do you feel that there are equal opportunities for career advancement? Um, there are multiple levels to this, right? It's usually like if you feel like you're in an environment where you um, have the resources you need to professionally develop whatever professional level you're at, 51% um, of the public said yes, whereas only 37% of our members said yes, for sure. Um, again, more uncertainty in our membership community, which could mean that, you know, people are not necessarily sure if there are, if they're receiving the right resources. We hear a lot of time that um, members or people in our community don't necessarily know what they don't know. Um, so sometimes this could come from an area of needing to um, have the right connections and to essentially um, feel like they're being tapped into um, what they actually need. And then there are a few um, line items here that uh, this, this chart is also available in the program that was sent in the chat. Um, do you feel like you have supportive colleagues? Do you feel like uh, resources are accessible? Do you feel comfortable um, expressing your ideas? Um, this is an area where uh, out of rating from one to five, members uh, had an average of around 3.4 and the public had an average of around 3.8 out of five. Um, do you feel like your uh, contributions and achievements are recognized? Um, uh, 3.2 was the average for the public whereas uh, it was less than three for our, for our members. So I encourage uh, everyone here to just take a look at some of these results. Uh, we do have some written responses that were um, contributed as well um, in terms of um, ideas or how people were thinking about systemic change um, in the computational biology field. Um, some similarities are that it seems like we're all on the same page in terms of needing mentorship, um, recognizing diversity, inclusion, um, networking, advocacy, educational outreach. But we do highlight some differences here in the uh, written responses from our members and the public. For instance, our members seem to have a, a seem to acknowledge more specific strategies or more uh, systemic issues and barriers uh, that could go a little bit deeper than uh, some of the broad solutions that we might all have language around, if that makes sense. Um, so our goal, not just today, but moving forward, forward is to be able to bridge the gap on what communities like ours need, not just black women, but disabled scientists, um, immigrant scientists, um, women in general. Um, you know, we're coming from our perspective as black women in the field, um, 
but we want to be able to bridge the gap on, of understanding of how we can create um, more conversations around these needs. Um, and so um, we got a few comments of uh, what we could do in the survey um, around this. Some of these were peculiar. Um, apparently, we should think more about how men are struggling in the workforce. Um, and there's also some nuance, right, in that we happen to be a community that focuses on just Black women. Um, but we recognize that um, our across different communities, across the diaspora, diaspora and um, across different efforts for liberation, we can't necessarily do things on our own. And so I also want to um, welcome people to uh, provide comment and um, see that from a, a new perspective, if that makes sense. So I'll end here this section uh, before we head into our first flash talk. Um, at least someone said, I'd love to see a virtual conversation about how advantaged groups can participate in being activists in this community. And that's essentially what we are here to do today. Um, advantaged groups doesn't necessarily have to be only white men or other uh, people, but um, we all have different privileges and all come in with different advantages with as scientists. And so I hope that this conversation can be a start to thinking about how we can engage and leverage those advantages. So I will stop sharing. Uh, Zoe uh, will be our first speaker. I'll go ahead and introduce you, Zoe, as you uh, cue your slides up. So Zoe Eddy is a PhD student in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University. Her research examines how experiences, whoops. Her research examines how experiences related to race and racial identity influence people's race conceptions and intergroup attitudes. She is passionate about improving diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in higher education. Thus, she's involved in multiple DEI committees, has mentored underrepresented students through the RISE at Rut Rutgers Summer Research Program, and co-created Rutgers Diversifying Psychology Day, which is the first ever event in the Rutgers Psychology Department designed to prepare potential psychology PhD applicants from underrepresented and minoritized backgrounds for the graduate admissions process. She, was, she will share with us a talk titled Perspectives on Intersectionality. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you. I uh, am ready to share my yeah, screen. Yes, I'm going to go ahead yeah. and do that. Um, and it might just need a second to get uh, exactly how I want it to look, but that should hopefully look OK. Um, OK. Looks great. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Zoe Eddy, and I'm really excited to be here today for a discussion about some perspectives on intersectionality and also to hear more from others about community building and allyship in computational um, biology. I wanted to just start off by giving you kind of a short introduction to who I am and the perspective that I'm coming in with um, when speaking with you all today. So I am a third year PhD student in the social psychology program at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I work with the Chris Lab, which is the Close Relationships Identity and Stigma Lab. So I conduct research on topics like people's conceptions or understandings of race and ways that we can reduce racial prejudice. Um, I also study multiracial people's experiences and how parents teach their children about race and their racial identity. So in a lot of my graduate coursework, I've taken classes related to race, and in these classes, we always consider intersectionality. So that's where my interest in the research on intersectionality first grew. And last summer, I taught my first college course, which was psychology of sex and gender. So that really encouraged me to think about intersectionality even more and applying um, identities like gender to the work that I study. So I've mentioned intersectionality a few times now, and um, I wanna go ahead and share a definition of it with you all. So intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. 
And this concept was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and it started in the context of the law. Um, so black women were being overlooked in discrimination cases because as long as companies were hiring black men and were hiring white women, black women could be ignored and their complaints did not hold any weight in the court of law because the companies were not technically discriminating against race or gender. So that's kind of one example of why intersectionality is so important because according to intersectionality, we do not just hold one social identity at a time. We hold many identities that span many different domains and those social identities aren't functioning independently. Instead, they're interacting with each other to create unique experiences depending on where you're positioned in regards to all of your identities. So as an example, my experience in the world as a multiracial black and white woman is very different than the experience of a monoracial white or monoracial black woman or other multiracial people who have different racial backgrounds. My experience as a straight multiracial woman will also be different than that of lesbian or biracial multiracial women for biracial, bisexual multiracial women, for example. Importantly though, Intersectionality is not just about compounding oppressions, but it's about looking at how your specific position in the world based on all of your identities will impact you differently than individuals that have different combinations of identities. So my experience in the world holding my specific identities positions me differently in this world than any other combination would as it does for all of you as well. And there are multiple ways that social psychologists study intersectionality, so I'm going to share a few of those with you today. Firstly, one topic that is studied a lot in social psychology um, is examining stereotypes, which are overgeneralized beliefs that are applied to members of a particular social group. There are stereotypes for different racial groups, so stereotypes for white and black people, for example. And there are stereotypes for different genders, like stereotypes for men and women. But research has shown that when you ask people to list stereotypes of white women and black women, for example, that they look different from the stereotypes that we would list for white people, black people, men and women more generally. So race and gender are interacting to produce unique stereotypes for each gendered racial group. So if you look at just race alone, or if you look at just gender alone, you would be missing a lot of nuance in the stereotypes that come from these combinations of identity groups. And there's also other social identities, of course, that contribute to the unique sets of stereotypes that individuals face. So as an example of intersectional stereotypes, um, there are unique stereotypes that racialized women face, including tropes such as the feisty Latina, or the angry black woman. And majority of past gender research has ignored race when assessing gender stereotypes, but intersectional stereotypes like these have huge implications for understanding gender differences in society and beliefs that we hold about men and women. There are multiple outcomes of these intersectional stereotypes. I'm gonna focus on two specific ones today. The first is double jeopardy, which in which having more than one stigmatized identity leads to heightened disadvantage. Black women, for example, face discrimination both on the basis of their race, their gender, and their unique position as a Black woman. And we can see examples of double jeopardy occurring in STEM fields. So some research, research has found that in STEM, Black women were more likely than other women to report having to prove their competency to um, other colleagues. And also in this study, Asian American women scientists were more likely than other women to report experiencing backlash for stereotypically masculine behaviors, like being assertive and self-promoting. So these are just some examples of um, what double jeopardy looks like. Another outcome of intersectional stereotypes is called intersectional invisibility. This happens when a combination of identities creates one identity that is rendered invisible and not acknowledged. An example of this could be Black women's unique position becoming invisible. And you can see this when you consider that our conceptions of racial justice often default to Black men and gender justice often defaults to white women. 
So some examples within the research of intersectional invisibility in a study with uh, multiple participants, there were photos of black women that were least likely to be recognized compared to photos of black men, white women and white men. And additionally, statements that were said by a black woman in a group discussion were least likely to be correctly attributed. So least likely to um, correctly say that this statement came from this black woman compared to black men, white women and white men. And then I wanted to also share just a little bit of the research on black women in STEM specifically. Um, to start, this is a newer topic of study in psychology right now. Uh, so these results focus on one review of multiple empirical articles about black women in STEM, and it describes some of the common themes that are being researched right now. So there's multiple papers focused on how to foster a strong STEM identity in black women, and this can be important for the retention of Black women in STEM, so that's why it's studied quite frequently. There's also work examining differences in STEM interests, confidence, and expectations among people with many different identities, such as comparing this among women and men more broadly, or comparing it among Black women and white women. Similarly, researchers are also comparing differences in achievement, perceptions of one's STEM ability and attributions. So if you do well on something, for example, if you're attributing that success to your own hard work or to an external factor. And lastly, there's a good amount of research focused on these social relationships and support systems that help Black women thrive in STEM fields and how that relates to the retention of Black women in STEM. And this all relates to an increasing focus on researching how to support Black women in STEM and increase the representation of Black women in STEM, which of course includes increasing the actual number of Black women in STEM. And I believe we'll get to hear a little bit more about that in um, Dr. Petrie's talk later on. So I thought sharing these might inspire some conversation about if these are important topics to study when focusing on Black women in STEM's experiences, or if there are other topics that are missing from the research right now that should be further explored. So in sum, intersectionality is about the fact that we all hold multiple identities, every single one of us, and it's important to recognize the unique experiences, challenges, and privileges that result from those combinations of identities for diverse individuals. And it's important that research continues to explore how to best support unique intersectional identities. Um, intersectionality is pretty new to the field of psychological research. Uh, research that takes an intersectional lens has really only been popular for the past 10 to 15 years. So that means that there's still a lot that psychologists haven't studied, and there's a lot of room for this field to grow while exploring this topic. And yeah, thank you all for your time today, and I'm excited to hear the conversations that will take place later on. Awesome, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, if you do have questions for Zoe in the meantime, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll get to them in a Q&A session uh, right after all the talks. All right, um, now we have Dr. Melanie Stefan. Um, welcome. Hi. We, uh, I'll do a brief introduction while she uh, queues up the slides. Um, Dr. Stefan is a professor of physiology at Medical School Berlin and head of a computational neurobiology research lab. Uh, her research interests revolve around using computers to understand learning and memory, from simulating how proteins in the brain work together to strengthen the connection between neurons, to using educational data to understand how students learn. In her spare time, she advocates for an open discussion about failure in science. She does, in fact, have a TED Talk about this on YouTube, which is really great and inspiring. Um, preceding that, in 2017, she co-authored an article in PLOS Computational Biology titled Women are Underrepresented in Computational Biology, an analysis of the scholarly, scholarly literature in biology, computer science, and computational biology. This article examined how the imbalance in gender ratios in biology and computer science reflected in the publication demographics in CompBio. We've invited Dr. Stefan here today to share her perspective on the progress of the field since this has been published and some of the key points of nuance for consideration by the broader community of computational biologists. Welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, excellent. So um, I have to start by um, disclosing my own imposter syndrome. So as um, uh, Jenny said in her very nice introduction, I'm, I'm really more of a computational biologist and I'm not really an expert on um, uh, women's representation in science or intersectionality or any of that. And um, Zoe's talk was really wonderful, but also heightened my imposter syndrome massively. So um, compared to, I think, the very nuanced and complex questions that she's asking, we were actually much more naive in our approach. And um, and so this is maybe um, a much simpler little talk. Um, but um, but yeah, uh, I think it it's a, um, I think some interesting things came out of this and um, I would like to share it with you all to get some more input as well. So the original idea was um, to look at whether biology is kind of like a gateway discipline for women to get into more computational fields. So this started with my colleague, with my then colleague, Kevin Bonham, and both of us were actually biologists by training who went more into bioinformatics and computing as we went on, as time went on and had to kind of teach ourselves how to do it. And we had this idea that maybe, you know, like women might be reluctant to go into computing in the first place, but might go into like a more female dominated field like biology. And then actually realized that they quite enjoy computational biology and bioinformatics and all these like more technical things. So, um, so we, this was kind of the thing that interested us um, at the beginning. So, um, so what we uh, did was we wrote um, an article. <laughs> I wanted to put the screenshot to it um, uh, in here and I forgot. So this is how well prepared I am. Um, I can share the actual link later. But um, because we are scientists, we, are, we have very simple minds. And so we thought, okay, we're just like, run a big, huge data analysis. So what we did was we pulled articles from PubMed and from Archive, um, and we kind of looked for articles um, in sort of more general biology and biomedicine and in kind of computational biology. So we used search terms like computational biology, bioinformatics, omics, things like that. Um, and we um, basically classified journals into whether they were more computational biology based or more general biology based, or for the archive articles also more like computing or informatics itself. And we also ran the author names then through a tool that's available online that assigns a gender probability. So you have like names like I don't know, Matthew, like most Matthews you meet will be men. Um, and there are names like, I don't know, Pat, where like some of the Pats you meet are going to be men and some of the Pats you meet are going to be women. And um, so this tool just uses like a lot of data from um, different places on the internet and passes them. And if it sees a name, it assigns a certain probability that this name is female. Um, based on context that name has appeared in in the past. Um, and that probability can be between zero and one, right? And so we can do this because it's a probabilistic thing, right? We can run this algorithm several times and we can run the stats on it and then look at authorship patterns. So this is basically what we did. Um, I have to add a massive disclaimer here, which is that the tool um, uh, basically assumes a gender binary, which is obviously bullshit. Um, <laughs> so um, we still used it because it kind of made our life easier in terms of the stats, um, but we acknowledge that it's an imperfect model, right? Um, and I'm by no means saying that there is a gender binary. And when I say male and female in this talk, I because we decided on this based on names, right? So I'm talking about socially lived gender and not any kind of weird biological essentialist crap. So I want to make this very clear. Um, and that's like, okay, I'm, I'm maybe not phrasing it in the most neutral way possible. So it's, it's very clear to, um, it's very easy to deduce what I think about all of this. Um, but anyway, this is a limitation of our study, let's see. Um, what we then did, um, what we did find was when we compared 
articles in biology and in computational biology, um, we saw basically three things about authorship, right? One is that computational biology as a field does worse than biology. Um, so you can see this here on the left side, the biology articles are the black bars, the computational biology is the grayer ones. And you can always see that the um, P female, so that the probability that um, an author is female over all publications basically is always lower for um, computational biology articles than for biology articles. On the right side, we have um, how it has evolved over the years. You can see that it gets maybe a little bit better, but um, not that quickly. And um, you can also see that computational biology is always underneath biology. And you can also see that even for biology, it's not that great. Right? Like I, I started my undergrad in 1999 and there were already like so many more women in the room than men, right? Um, maybe like 10% of my classmates were male. Um, and yet, right, in 2015, when all of these people have graduated and gotten their PhDs and um, are basically old enough to be in the scientific day-to-day, uh, -day, um, still the proportion of female authors, you can read that um, as that, right, even in biology papers is less than 40%. So not great, not great. Um, it gets a little bit better with time. And what we see on the left here is also how it um, how it scales for authorship position, right? So we can see that um, last authors are even less likely to be women than first authors and middle authors. And in um, it's different in different fields, right? But in a lot of biology, the last author is usually the PI, the head of the lab. The first author is basically the person who does all the work. And then the middle authors are people who kind of contributed in some way, right? Maybe they did some of the experiments, maybe they contributed materials and things like that. And so we can see that with seniority, the proportion of women also um, uh, decreases. But what, one interesting thing we thought, and we didn't follow up on it because we didn't, it was not our main project, we didn't have the resources, but I thought it was really interesting, was that there was a last author effect. So here again, we see the proportion of female authors in all of the authorship positions, so FSOP means first, second, other, penultimate. Um, and then we grouped it though by whether the last author was male and female. And we saw that if the last author is a woman, then it's also more likely for every other author to be a woman. So if the last author is a woman, it's more likely that the first author is also a woman. Um, and also the second author and so on. And so this is like, I thought this was really interesting, right? Because it's, we talk a lot about, do we need quotas or do we need to foster um, women? And this is also true for other marginalized identities, right? Do we need um, mechanisms by which they can succeed? And this very clearly shows that probably yes, right? Because if we have, more of us in leading positions, then it's also better for the younger ones that sort of come after us. And um, of course, there could be several explanations for this, right? And some are nice and some are not so nice, right? So um, there could just be subfields that are more female dominated and that then are more likely to have last authors who are women and also first authors who are women, but that's a possibility. It could be though that female PIs give more opportunities to their female mentees or more credit, right? Um, so they are more likely to grant them authorship on a paper for similar work than a male PI would be. It could be that women seek out women as mentors. It could be that women avoid men as mentors. And um, there's certainly some men that I would avoid as mentors. Um, it could be that men avoid women as mentors, right? So, so some of those explanations are quite, um, I think, optimistic and cheery, and some of them might actually be quite dark. But also I think an important explanation, uh, explanation is that it matters what we see, right? And the kind of role models we have as our mentors, as our PIs, as our bosses, it's really impacting our own careers. Um, and, um, and I think this is not only true, um, I mean, we, we did our study on gender, right? But I think it's also true for a lot of other um, identities. Um, 
as I said, we really didn't have the means to follow up on this and to see which explanation I think is probably going to be a mixture. But it would be really interesting to see someone take this further and follow up on, on really what the meaning is of this last author effect. Um, I took inspiration from that last sentence, it matters what we see. And I looked back at um, all the lectures. So um, I teach um, physiology in a big um, medical school in Germany where the students have to go through a two year physiology course um, in the first four semesters. And there's a whole team of professors who teach this together. So there's four professors who teach all of the physiology together. And I sat down yesterday and I looked at all of the lectures we do over those two years. And I looked at every instance where a picture is shown of a scientist who invented something and their name is said in the lecture, right? So um, what, um, what kind of examples do we give our students of scientists? And um, I, I mean, uh, we could play a little quiz um, as to what you think all these white men have in common. I don't know. It's, um, and there is, I mean, to be fair, there is one white woman in there. Um, so thanks to Margaret Moser, or thanks to us for considering her. So this is really not great, right? And I think um, this also means, I mean, for me, this really means that I need to be more thoughtful in what I tell my students that a scientist looks like, right? Or that a computational biologist looks like. And this is really something that I have taken to heart and I need to, yeah, that I'm, I'm working on right now because I do think it matters what we see. And then I had the problem that I wanted to end my talk here, but I think it would have ended on this slide of like basically white men and that I'm, I can't have that. So, um, so I just like stole a picture from you guys' website. And um, I think this is a much more, um, positive and, and lovely picture. And this is really what I would like computational biology and science as a whole to look like. And with that, I thank you. Oh, Janae, I think you're muted. Of course. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for the talk. I uh, really appreciate everything that you shared. Um, I remember the first time I even looked up anything about women in comp bio, you, literally your paper was the only thing that existed on the internet. So um, thank you for being here today and for contributing that. Um, so everyone, we've heard about like, how do we think about intersectionality from different perspectives? We've heard a little bit about what the current landscape of comp bio looks like. So we're here to talk about allyship. And so um, our next talk is by uh, Dr. Pietri. Um, it's actually a pre-recorded talk um, as uh, she's not able to join us today, um, but uh, she does have some great insights on uh, allyship interventions. Dr. Ava Pietri is the PI of the Pietri Social Intervention and Attitudes Lab and an associate professor at Colorado University Boulder. Um, before arriving at CU, Dr. Pietri was an assistant professor at IUPUI for six years. She received her PhD in psychology from OSU. After receiving her PhD, she uh, completed a postdoc position at Yale University, during which she worked in the psychology department and in the Center for Scientific Teaching. An overarching goal of the SIA lab is to investigate how basic processes in social cognition and attitudes influence a variety of domains that are pertinent to real world issues. The lab aims to use theories and research from social psychology to guide the development of interventions. Much of their current research focuses on reducing biases and promoting diversity in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, so with that, we will, oh, Sagal, are we? Yep, I'm gonna share my screen. Just okay. let me know if the audio is okay. Okay. No audio, but um, there's no audio on it. No, you know how to share audio. Um, let me just try this again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as we get this set up, if anyone has any questions for the last two talks, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them in a few minutes. Um, I can share this specific tab for audio. Melissa, would you be able to? Oh, okay. okay. Let me uh, let me try. Give me a try. Oh, wait. Are you guys seeing? Oh, yeah. Hey, on allyship interventions during this fantastic town hall. And I'm also really sorry that I couldn't be there in real time today, uh, but I'm excited to share this video. So before I start my talk, I want to note that I'll be discussing a model of allyship that my collaborators and I are currently working on for a review. So I just want to quickly acknowledge these amazing collaborators, Dr. Veronica Derricks, Dr. India Johnson, and Dr. Charlotte Mosher. Also, because this is a quick talk, I'll be discussing concepts at a very high level. However, everything I talk about today is based on empirical research and studies. Also, when I talk about allies, I'm talking about people with advantage identities working to uplift, advocate, and support individuals with marginalized identities. So when done correctly, there are many benefits associated with allies. Allies can empower marginalized individuals to report mistreatment. They can also increase their self-esteem and general well-being. Also, when people know there are a lot of allies in a given space, it enhances their feelings of belonging and inclusion in that space. So just as one example of this work, India and I ran a study with Black women STEM majors. And in this study, we found that the more Black role models they had at their university, so role models being somebody the student feels similar to and aspires to be like, the more belonging the students felt at their university and the more belonging they felt in STEM. However, we know that people don't always have access to role models matching their most important identities. And so importantly, we also found that the more non-Black allies the students reported having, the more belonging they felt at their university and in STEM as well. So a small ally gesture, such as wearing a Black Lives Matter pin, can be great during a short interaction and it can gender, engender feelings of trust. However, you may need more actions during more sustained relationships. So for example, imagine the person wearing the Black Lives Matter pin was a colleague of yours. And one day at work, you notice that this person stayed quiet after witnessing bias or didn't confront this bias or mistreatment. In this situation, you not only would not consider this person an ally, but they might actually be actively harmful in their performative actions. And in fact, a lot of supposed ally actions in response to the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020 were considered insincere and felt very transient. And there were many articles written about this performative allyship. So this, of course, then leads to the question, well, what can people do to show they are true and sincere allies? Well, luckily, there's a vast and growing literature on allies. And based on this work, my colleagues and I have developed a four A's of allyship framework suggesting that there are four elements required for successful and effective allyship. This framework is derived from literature that centers on the perspectives and experiences of marginalized groups. So in particular, we're arguing that people can't simply self-proclaim, okay, I'm an ally, um, but rather marginalized individuals must view that person as an ally. So basically the ally title needs to be earned. So the first day is awareness. And that entails being aware of a group's experiences and mistreatment and how that group is marginalized in society. It also involves noticing subtle bias and mistreatment between individuals and also recognizing systemic biases and how these systems can lead to one's identities being privileged by society. The second A is being authentically motivated. So as I mentioned, a major criticism of recent, recent attempts at allyship was that they were performative and inauthentic. So to be a true ally, one needs to be helping for internal or intrinsic reasons or because they match their personal values. 
And it's important that they're not only helping to look good or to be told, hey, you're a great person. And consequently, being authentically motivated means not centering yourself and your own needs in your actions. So basically doing the actions for others, which then really nicely leads to action orientation. So basically, authentic motivation is ultimately going to be signaled through your actions. So first, to show authenticity, it's critical that you're consistent in your actions and also that you engage in meaningful and somewhat high cost actions. So certainly doing smaller behaviors like wearing the Black Lives Matter pin are not necessarily harmful. You can do those too. But if that's the only thing you do, it'll appear insincere and inauthentic. So some meaningful actions that people can engage in include discussing the issues, so discussing instances of mistreatment or systemic bias. Also, importantly, confronting bias and mistreatment when you see it and working to support, sponsor, and advocate for marginalized individuals. So for example, if you feel a colleague's comment is being ignored, say something like, well, hey, this person's making an excellent point. I really think we need to listen to them. And then finally, the final A, it's really critical that allies are all inclusive or are allies for all members of marginalized groups. So for example, being an ally for women doesn't just mean being an ally for heterosexual, cisgender, white women. Doing so might require overriding default processes because it's often easiest to think of group members who are only marginalized along that identity, but also have many other privileged identities. So for instance, there's a lot of work showing that when people think of the typical women, they think of white women, rendering black women invisible and not thinking of their needs and ally actions. However, the ways that Black women, Asian women, Latinas, and white women require support may look very different. So, like I said, this is a really quick talk. Um, so that's a brief overview of the allyship literature and our framework. Thank you so much for listening today. I have my contact information up here. So if you have any questions about my talk or would like to know about any of the articles or would like me to send the articles, I'm happy to do so that I discussed with regard to allyship. All right, thank you so much. Awesome. We're really excited that um, Dr. Pichi was able to share that talk. And I hope we all are able to see how a lot of these topics really do overlap. Um, and I hope that you are continuing to uh, think a little bit more about how you might engage today. Um, we do have time for two questions. We can do one from the chat and one if one person wants to unmute. I will adjust. Um, okay, it looks like we have one from Jatisha. Uh, Zoe, um, I may have missed, but are there recommendations for what kind of support can help to address intersectionality? People usually mention representation, but that isn't always available and may take a long time to see in any given field. Are there other forms of support that can be helpful for intersectionality? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so because the kind of study of intersectionality is fairly new, usually the supports or um, recommendations are just to try to use more of an intersectional lens when studying topics related to um, identities we would usually kind of think of as separate, um, so like race and gender and prejudice, or um, like the um, lower representation of women in STEM, for example, used to be the main focus. And so now there's kind of a push to consider an intersectional lens and the focus on the underrepresentation of women of color specifically in STEM. Um, so I know that was still related to representation, which I totally agree that um, that's not the best way to I or not the only thing we should focus on when encouraging, um, trying to build more um, retention of uh, people in STEM in general. Um, so yeah, hopefully that is kind of a clear answer. It's more in the sense of, um, yeah, using intersectionality as a lens and trying to find ways to help people um, in different aspects of their identities and things like that. Nice. Thanks, Zoe. Um, one more qu question comes from Christopher. 
As a white male ally, how do you be an advocate within your organization without trying to run the show? For example, where your organization doesn't have a DEI committee. Anyone can answer this or provide comment. Melanie, do you maybe I can give a, a, an example of something that happened recently in in my workplace? Is that you know like. And I, this happens so often, right? Like a round of people are sitting together and some one of the guys tells a sexist joke, right? Which is just a joke, but it's still like, or makes a comment or something. And once in my life, I would, I would like to see one of the other men say, hey, that was not cool. <laughs> like, it's always like the women wouldn't say, oh, come on, was that really necessary, right? It's like, it would be... So and I mean I you know maybe the other men just then take him aside at some point and say no that was not cool but like calling people in publicly doing that work right like if you see and I mean this is also some of what we heard in in the last talk right if you see someone being treated differently or talked about differently just to speak up and say something and that doesn't take a lot right but it's so it would mean so much yeah i agree um just thinking about how to be that support in your own space in your own peer circles i feel like that's true for the mentors i look up to for the people i call as friends the people that i want to be in community with um and I think just that extra consideration is sometimes all we can do. Um, but that's not the you know final answer. Okay, so let us go into a very quick breakout room as we get ready to warm up into some further discussion. I'm gonna open up these rooms for uh, about four minutes. There's only gonna be a couple people in there. As you're in these rooms, I encourage you to introduce yourself uh, very briefly but also, um, oh, uh, yes, As before we do that, I do wanna share. Uh, Chrissy, do you wanna screen share or should I spotlight you? Okay. So here's the progress of our illustration so far. Um, it's <laughs> crazy to think about that this was literally being constructed right before our eyes, uh, but this is super great so far. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open these breakout rooms. As I said, if you don't have one, if there's only one other person in there, um, I will move you around. Uh, but the question is, what stood out to you in today's talk so far? Alrighty, sorry that probably cut off some conversations, but I hope some of the discussion was good and people are feeling like they know at least one more person here today. Um, so we can start off with uh, maybe one or two groups. Does anyone wanna share what came up and what you shared? Um, the question was, what's something that stood out to you from the, the topics, um, from the talks? Um, 
Hi, um, I'm Alexander Mishar in uh, Northwestern University, Chicago. Uh, we didn't get actually a chance to talk much about this, but I think uh, for me personally, the second talk by Melanie actually really stood out um, because as I was trying to recruit uh, women, you know, who do computational biology, not just black women, but just, you know, like any women and bring them into graduate school, um, that, that just really resonated with me, you know, because having interviews with them and making sure that they will, um, they will see the path forward, right? And how, like, how I am as a, you know, like white male is going to give them perspective that they can actually establish themselves uh, in computational uh, research. So that was actually an interesting challenge for me. And Melanie's talk really resonated with me, how we can actually carve this environment. And, um, you know, what we've done in our group, actually, um, we don't have a, um, like senior computational faculty working in our group, and I'm not a computational biologist. I'm, I'm a biologist and translational researcher, but obviously I use computational biology, you know, to answer our questions. So what we've done, actually, we, um, we brought for a six-month sabbatical one of the leaders in uh, applied biomedical machine learning to our group, and uh, she was absolutely amazing. Uh, her name is Eva Sturik. Uh, she just recently accepted uh, one of the leadership positions at Hempfall Center uh, at, in Munich. So anyway, she came here and she brought up her entire uh, lab. Okay, not entire lab. Her lab is really big, but she brought up like three or four people with her. Uh, and they stayed with us for several months. And I think, you know, for young women who are working with us, you know, who are either, you know, in data analyst position before they uh, went into graduate school or uh, those women who actually join us, um, as graduate students, uh, that was really transformative experience. You know, like having your someone who really showed them an example that this is where you can get, and this is, you know, how you can run your lab. I think that was really inspirational for them. So we, you know, we had to have this, you know, short-term transplant into our group to uh, inspire uh, to inspire our women in our group. Thanks, Alex, for sharing. So yeah, it seems like it took maybe. Um, some work to find the right people, but, um, you know, that kind of helped you to um, find new talent and scientists for your lab. Um, and that was inspired by Melanie's talk. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? One thing that stood out to you or surprised you uh, from today's talks? Okay, so my next question then is how often do you think about your identity with the respect to with respect to the work that you do and how you professionally develop? I think as computational biologists, um, now living in the age of all of us UMAPs are um, engaging in different ways with how we might think about um, race and how we might classify race, for instance, that's just one axis of it. But what does that look like for everyone else here? I'll jump in. Um, I work in um, clinical genetic testing, clinical genomics. And so um, the implications of what we do affects real patients and their their clinical journey and diagnostics and such. And um, in most spaces, I've been the only Black person and often the only Black or Brown person. And um, I actually find myself holding back from sitting in that DEI chair because my training is not in that. And that's where I, I try to actually take the spaces saying that we need a person at the table that's an expert in that rather than me using my lived experience to try to be an expert. I didn't get, I didn't choose that training. Um, so I would say that's one way that I actually take my um, physical and social experience and put it in my professional world is saying I'm not the expert in this and we need the expert at the table. Yeah, Asia, I think that's a big um part of at least how I'm navigating my professional life. And I think also how BWCB hopes to engage with the public. 
right? Like we have, we're, we've all acknowledged that the scientists here were not experts. We brought in some experts who think scientifically a little bit more about some of these topics. Um, but I'm hoping that the rest of the conversation today, you know, we don't necessarily have to be experts to think about how we are experiencing our world, the world around us and how we can um, brainstorm and share new ideas. Um, but yeah, I think that boundary is super important and something that I think um, definitely comes up from people from marginalized groups, trying not to um, add on the emotional tax of all the servicing and all the, you know, helping out and doing the glue work of things. So yeah, for sure. All right, anyone else wanna share? So my next question then would be, um, thinking about the survey insights shared, it's also in the program. We might have to share that again in the chat for the people who just joined, um, about the different experiences in terms of feeling support in your workplace, feeling like you can speak up, um, feeling like you have the resources to engage in sponsorship and mentorship. Um, how have these topics maybe come up in uh your world as a computational biologist and as a comp bio person, are there specific considerations we might need to take um, in order to um, kind of bridge the gap of what we've we've shared here? A loaded question, but definitely want to get your thoughts. Um, I was curious about uh, the types of support, maybe, that, that people in the survey who said they felt supported, what kind of support they might be getting, if it's, and whether it's at work or in school, or whether it's external to their work in school. I don't remember if that was one of the, the survey questions, but yeah, I'd be curious about um, what it is about their experience that makes them feel supported. So what in that to you is important? Uh, what are the aspects? Like, how would you parse that out? I, so it, it goes back to my, the question I was <laughs> asking Zoe. Just, I'm just curious, like, how do, we, how do we help ourselves individually? How do we help other people who might, might feel they're not feeling supported? Um, I, you know, I don't usually think about my own intersectionality very often. But when I do, it's usually because I'm questioning my skills. I'm questioning my abilities or, you know, I'm feeling some imposter syndrome. So um, when I think about feeling supported, I, I'm just wondering, like, how else can I help myself? How else can I maybe, if I wanted to and had the capacity to mentor another person, how could I help them as well? Mm -hmm. Um, like thinking about when I needed support or when I what I feel that I need more support in it's often like sometimes the more like political or soft skills part of what we're doing like do I go to this person or this person for help should I be asking this question or is there a resource that I I can you know watch you know on how to do an analysis for free or just knowing the different possibilities of what's out there. And it's it's sometimes hard to like know the exact questions to ask, but you, you know that you like, you feel stuck in some way and you need help, but you not necessarily know who can provide that. And sometimes there are support, like structures for support out there and you go to them and um, what's actually delivered is not actually helpful. And so having, I think in terms of support, just having multiple people that you can bounce these uh, feelings off of, of um, feeling stuck and wanting to pivot or move on in a certain way, that's like where I would want more, more support in. Mm -hmm. Maybe two. 
I may speak again. Uh, so maybe to follow up on Melissa's question and uh, Jatisha's uh, comments too. Uh, what what we've done in our group actually we we try to make sure well don't try we we actively actually integrate computational uh, biologists with wet bench biologists and um, I think this really actually empowers uh, computational biologists to do you know uh, to to really shine right when they are not just you know like acting independently well here's some analysis that I've done you know like now you know you guys figure it out. But when they actually work very closely um, from the you know experimental design steps you know to experimental execution, they oversee all the steps and they're actively involved in this process. So they have a lot of uh, you know ownership and they have a lot of actual say you know from the very early steps. Uh, you know what what we saw in our group this actually empowers computational biologists you know to be you know not just bioinformaticians but be actual biologists and ask real questions. Uh, they may not have, uh, you know, skills to, you know, to do some wet bench experiments, but they actually have intellectual skills, uh, you know, to design experiments and to ask those questions and then, you know, work with other people to execute this properly. So for our group, this was actually empowering. And I think this goes both ways um, uh, because then, you know, the biologist will also, you know, act uh, as, uh, you know, friends uh, and uh, advocates, you know, for the type of analysis that was, uh, you know, that was done by their colleagues. So there is much more buying on both sides. It's not just a service, right? They really work to work together. And, uh, and then, you know, on the other side, we we actually had to outline, you know, certain uh, lab policies and guidelines for how people actually act. And um, one of the one of the uh, points is that um, we actively encourage people to uh, speak about failed experiments and speak about things that didn't work or you know like you know stuff that it's normal. We actively try to normalize this and actually you know say like yes, eighty percent of your hypothesis will fail; they will be wrong. Uh, and um, again, just because there is a wealth of um, sequencing data already available we mostly talk about sequencing data uh you can actually do a lot of you know testing you know beforehand before you engage in the experiment and uh computational people are really you know empowered to do this so uh when we you know come up with a new hypothesis we say well you know can we actually quickly query the data can we see you know if you know if our, our pathway is activated here you know like does make sense you know shall we even do this and I think actually like putting computational people on the forefront of modeling uh, where, you know, where they can really just, you know, create the models of reality and quickly query them and make good predictions about the experiments. Again, they're becoming active drivers of, um, you know, of our web bench work. Uh, and, you know, I think that this is also empowering. Um, I think this also helps uh, computational people to be active drivers of the process and have more active voice. Yeah, I think uh, just bringing some synergy between um, what was just shared the last three people is I think um, a lot of experience in uh, like the comp bio world. I don't know if we're still experiencing the same thing in terms of maybe not being taken as seriously or uh, not being able to get out of that middle author position sometime or not necessarily being seen as um, whole scientists. But maybe it is that access of creating space for people to have more ownership, um, showcase their skills, grow their skills in new dimensions, while also um, providing um, opportunities for people from marginalized groups to help themselves feel supported and build community if that community doesn't necessarily come from within their lab, within their department. Um, I think we also hear, and we've talked about like in our very first blog post after our very first meeting in 2020, about um, the challenge also of being an international scientist, um, trying to bring your credentials for some of us that are coming from different countries that are not just the main ones in Europe or uh, Canada, um, trying to come to the US and bring skills where your credentials are not valued the same way or your training is not valued the same way, even though you, are, you have those, the, that expertise. Um, so sometimes maybe that not knowing what's missing, like Jatisha was saying, well, am I not getting this opportunity? And then you go down the laundry list of your your identities. Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm Black? Is it because I'm this? When really there's just not necessarily um, 
there hasn't ever really been a solid foundational system of support. So um, a lot of the challenges are coming from many different aspects, if that makes sense. So my next question is, how have your own experiences shaped your perspective on intersectionality and comp bio? Um, now that we have a little bit of language to put to some of this, um, does anyone have any experiences to share or um, kind of a new look on, on what was discussed today? If not, that's also okay. My next question then will be, um, what specific actions or interventions do you think can contribute to a more inclusive environment in comp bio? I think a one caveat to this is that um, given what Dr. Pietri shared in her talk um, and how some of us have interacted with performative allyship or performative um, support. Um, sometimes inclusion is actually not the goal, and that's something that not everyone wants to hear. Um, sometimes it's just um, support where we are and rethinking ways of how to rebuild the, the current systems that are already not inclusive. There's no, there's sometimes there's not um, always a need uh, to be invited to the table, so on, so to speak. Um, because the table hasn't wanted us for a long time. So I don't want to eat there. Um, so how do you maybe um, people from many different advantage groups, whether uh, we're able-bodied or, you know, we have the advantage of um, being in the U.S. when, you know, uh, there are several different types of resources here. How along those different axes, uh, axes of identity do you think about specific actions or interventions to contribute to a more inclusive environment? I'll jump in. Um, so yeah. I think one of the um, interesting things about the space for in computational biology, sorry, my cat, um, is that you can come from a different place and end up in computational biology. And so I think um, sharing your journey to computational biology is always kind of a good icebreaker because most of us did not start in computational biology from day one. We, we got training in something else and then found our way this way. And, um, and also like there's so many different flavors of computational biology. There's all ways you could be doing computational biology. So just talking about what you're working on, what you're interested in with different folks and just kind of finding where there's commonalities, but also finding where there's differences in your story. Um, and I think on the flip side of that, that, that also reduces the barrier in complexity of like, well, how do I get into something like that? Because I'm doing this thing and this thing is so far removed from computational biology. Um, it's really not because at some point every area of biology, chemistry, physics, it creates um, a lot of data and our world with data and um, statistics and computing, they collide when you're trying to, you know, create models or understand um, complex questions. So that and um, also just not being afraid to just talk to new people and to introduce yourself um, yeah, or receive being talked to by new people.
Thanks, Asia. Anyone else? Oh, um, Adam has their hand up. Uh, I, I wanted to say that I think one thing that could be important is networking. Like, I know a lot of people who look like me. And if, if you know somebody, like, you're more likely to, to, like, get them into your lab, right? Or, like, find them a thing to do. Like, that's how a lot of people get jobs. And I, I think an important thing might be getting to know a lot more people who are different than I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, thanks for highlighting that. I think we definitely align, um, like, in our communities between the members and the people who responded to the survey, as we said. It seems like networking is, is we know that we need to do that. I guess maybe diving deeper, like what's the barrier then? Um, I think for me, not all advice is good advice. Not all advice actually even applies to my certain situation um, or comes from a perspective that acknowledges me as someone who's like partnered, who's a woman, who is not gonna move to the middle of America actually to work somewhere. Um, so what does that, what are the barriers there? If we know that networking is important, if we know that there is, um, you know, exposing people to comp bio earlier is important, what do you think is a challenge that comes up? Maybe not you specifically, Adam, thank you for sharing, but um, anyone else have a perspective on that? I just wanted to reiterate what Alexander said about sharing failures. I, mm -hmm. I love that idea because there have been so many times where I've been struggling with something and I hesitated to ask anyone because I maybe felt like I would sound ridiculous. But when I did ask them, they would say, oh, yeah, I struggled with that too, or I couldn't figure it out either. Mm -hmm. Or if I Googled it around, I find a blog of somebody talking about how they struggled with it too. So I think um, just talking about how hard it can be to do computational biology sometimes might help people feel less, I don't know, alone in it. Yeah, I feel like sometimes there's, um, you know, I think an imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people experience. But I think the other side of that is sometimes we, we might feel that the consequence of feeling like you don't know something or um, are struggling with something is very different. Um, I think there are some people in society that we give a lot of wiggle room to fail. And so just by learning from that, um, sometimes it's hard to feel comfortable with that failure. Actually, Melanie, you're a great person to ask about that. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Melanie, you're an expert on failure. <laughs> you're not a lot. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, can I just explain what you're referring to so that people think don't think I'm yeah, yes, <laughs> good at feeling. Um, I wrote um, a, a little commentary a few years ago saying that we should all have like a resume of failures um, uh, alongside our real one and publish it so that we can sort of share and talk about our failures. But I, yeah, I didn't want to derail the conversation. I just wanted to explain that um, that sentence, you know, this topic of failure makes me think of Melanie is, is actually, that's, that's why. <laughs> yes, awesome. All righty, so my last question then uh, would be, what do you think over the next year, two years, maybe three years, are some pressing needs in the computational biology field um, in terms of um, building bridges, making new connections, ensuring people feel connected to different groups of people? Um, what does CompBio need drastically over the next, like in the near, near future? I think in the near future we can have we should have events like this probably more embedded into 
<clears throat> larger comp bio conferences or meetings just so that this opportunity, I feel like this is something that we need to continually grow in. And so making this one of the priorities um, will be important. Yes, I agree. <clears throat> Alrighty. So, uh, and also Arjun in the chat says, addressing and unveiling the hidden curriculum and comp bio. That is almost an entirely separate event that we could talk about. <laughs> so thanks for sharing that. All right, so we are at the end of the event here. Um, Kaylin, will, our professional development coordinator, will briefly share an opportunity for us to continue some of these conversations. Um, if you RSVP'd for this event today, uh, you should have also seen uh, a question about um, asking if you're interested in joining our Connect Circles. Um, and so uh, Kaylin will explain a little bit about that opportunity uh, for you now. Um, cool. So hi, everyone. Um, so our discussion on networking and how important it is is actually a great segue to this new program that we're um, starting. So last year, we introduced our mentoring program where members of different experience levels were paired up to foster personal and professional growth of a mentee. Um, Connect Circles, on the other hand, is not inherently a mentoring program, but it's an opportunity to network broader, more broadly throughout the comp bio community. Um, so what the, the goal is, um, is for this initiative to bring together members and supportive and dynamic networking pods um, or Connect Circles. Um, to go beyond surface level interaction and use the power of community to grow professional networks. Um, these are open to all active members and registered supporters of BWCB. So if you need to register, um, you can do that at our website, blackwomencompbio.org slash supporters sign up. Um, it's also in the chat. If you need to sign up as a member, you can also do that at our website, um, blackwomencompbio.org slash join. Um, but the goals of these circles is um, they're expected to meet monthly as a group. Um, and then there will also be opportunities to join community-wide networking opportunities each quarter between April and December of this year. So these will kind of be like shorter versions of the structured event that we had today. Um, but instead of being a public event, it'll just be your inner connect circle. Um, the sign-up deadline for the first cohort will be Monday, March 25th. You can sign up using the interest form that should also be in the chat now, I think. Um, or at our website under Connect Circles. Um, and then all matches will be sent out in early April. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about this new initiative. We're hoping that this kind of gives us an opportunity to widen our circles, network more, and kind of get in touch with people that we wouldn't normally you know, speak to at a conference or we don't normally have connections with. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can email info at blackwomencompbio.org. Um, and we might have time now to take a few questions. Um, but if not, you can always just contact us through the website um, or our email. Thanks, Kaylin, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, oops. Uh, yes, the Connect Circles uh, link is in the chat, as Kaylin mentioned. Um, and we're open now for all of your signups. That does conclude our event for today. Um, here's the second part of the illustration uh, illustration that Chrissy put together. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll share the final product of this on our website. Um, before you head out, uh, please do uh, complete this uh, feedback form. Um, it's in the chat here as a Google form. We'd love to know your thoughts about how you uh, experienced today's event um, as we continue to put more opportunities on. The Connect Circles will be probably your next best step um, to stay connected with BWCB and other uh, supporters in our community. Um, so you're welcome to uh, sign up for those. And we'll have kind of more broader events like this each quarter that everyone will be engaged in. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll, I'll stay on a couple minutes later to, to answer them. But that's all for today. Thank you all for your time, for your patience, and for your contributions. I'm so excited uh, for the next edition of this in the future.
Thank you so much. Yes, Bye. thank you. Thanks to our speakers. Oh, whoops. Um, if anyone has to go, feel free. I was just reading the, the last comment, but...